Hello everyone, this is Joshua Smith of Apollo's Artifacts. It is 2019. This is yet another entry of supplemental information material for the Satanic Panic series that I've been working on. Specifically, this one is also related to the McMartin trial. In this episode, I'm going to do a commentary, criticism, and review purely for the purposes of historical education. An article that was published January 12, 1990 in the Village Voice called The Ritual Sex Abuse Hoax by Debbie Nathan. For those who have read Professor Ross Chite's book, The Witch Hunt Narrative, you'll recognize Nathan's name as one of the chief architects of the Satanic Panic Mythos or the Witch Hunt Narrative itself. I will link the article below. My printed off version is five pages in length. Many times in this article, you'll see the key points of the witch hunt narrative turning up over and over again. So I'll begin by moving down to the fifth paragraph, which begins, quote, Irrationality pervaded the McMartin case from the beginning. The first allegation came from a woman later diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. This is, of course, referring to Judy Johnson. Now, this claim is not true so far as I can find. There is no actual official diagnosis of this lady anywhere. Now, if this is uh, purportedly coming from an ER visit that she had or a brief hospital stay which she may have had, this diagnosis is highly unlikely to have actually come from either a psychiatrist or a psychologist. This is probably an ER attending physician whose expertise is not in the mental or psychological realm. So I'm very dubious of this claim here that she was officially diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. Now she was the mother, for those who do not know, of the first child who was taken to a doctor and actually ended up going to see four different doctors who all agreed that some kind of sexual molestation or sexual abuse had happened to this child, and it was actually physicians who first contacted the police. Now, what you see over and over in the witch hunt or satanic panic mythos narrative, the claim is always that Judy Johnson was a really crazy, unhinged mother who made the first contact with police. That is actually not true. Two paragraphs later, we come to yet another problematic claim. It says, the McMartin School was painstakingly probed for tunnels. None were found. Well, again, this is not exactly the truth. Now, there's an interview that I will link below where a private investigator by the name of Ed Opperman actually bothered to follow up with one of the geologists who first came there to do the seismic testing and ground studies. Now, in the limited areas, highly restricted areas that he was actually allowed to look, he did not find evidence of tunnels. However, he said there was a connected area of buildings that they were not allowed to look at. He was told by people on site, and you can hear all of this in the interview with Mr. Opperman, and he said that later he was to find out that the people who owned the property probably did own this other connecting property as well, and that the tunnels could have been there, and in fact, I think that's where Stickle's report, which I'll link below, actually did find what he claimed were tunnels. Now, this geologist also said that around the north face of the building, there was an unfinished basement area that had been, as he said, hand dug. And he did calculations that showed that at least two dump truck loads full of dirt had been removed from this area, creating this small cavern at the north facing of the school. Over at the top of page two, we have another problematic claim here. It says, quote, Hardly anyone acknowledged that most of the jurors had concluded the children had likely not been abused except possibly by their own relatives and certainly by the investigation itself. Well, this is actually false. Seven of the jurors later said that they could have found Ray Bucky guilty. However, the case was simply too big, too complicated, too much information to take in, and uh, some people even said there's no way you could ever get 12 people to agree on this case no matter what, no matter which way it was presented. And a little over midway down the same page, we start getting a lot of the left-wing nonsense, from the, which is the position from which she comes to sort of uh, construct this whole thing. It says, quote, moral panics, the Salem witch trials, and McCarthyism, for example, and of course, you can go back and watch my video on McCarthyism where you find out that McCarthy was actually right. She probably doesn't really need to refer to that one because that really undermines her case because when you had the opening of the 
Venona Files, you had it revealed that McCarthy was even more right than he ever even knew himself. Anyway, continuing, have often run rampant through cultures in flux, and, quote, ritual abuse is today's mythic expression of deep-seated worries over sweeping changes in the family. Now, where does she get this at all? I mean, this is just completely left-wing, made-up, bull nonsense, okay? Since the 1970s, the number of working women have risen, and so have the divorce rates in female-headed households. Now, of course, I've already pointed out to you prior to this in the episode on Kinsey why the family was being destroyed and why these rates were changing and why they were all going up across the board. And that's also related to the welfare state system, which incentivizes the destruction of the family. That's also tied to increased crime rates and debt across the nation. Children are being socialized less by family authority and more by the media in its consumerist focus on the erotic. Yet AIDS has imbued Eros with a new danger. All these changes spell anxiety. So again, see, you have the same things that you hear the left claiming today. It's just that anyone who's upset about anything, anyone who's um, concerned about things that are going on, it's it's just their anxiety. It's just this bizarre emotional state. And we don't really know why they have it, but we also should not feel any sympathy for the people who have this anxiety. They need to be uh, repressed and punished and pushed back and told how stupid they are for having any kind of anxiety. And she really gets to... um, you know, her her feelings on this whole thing right here. Quote, for conservatives, they are literally sinful. And since moral traditionalists hate public daycare, really, do they? All moral traditionalists hate public daycare? I don't think that's actually the case. She continues, a right-wing impulse to demonize child care workers is not surprising. And of course, none of this stuff came from right-wing people who just wanted to demonize child care workers or anything like that. As I pointed out before, one of the things that you have is this interesting cross-sectional overlap of people who are involved in the construction of the witch hunt narrative of the satanic panic mythos, as it were. The right-wingers have been brought into this because they don't like the state being involved with the family where the state comes in with CPS or whatever and they see a sink full of dirty dishes and then they take the kids away and put them in a foster care system or something like that. That's what they don't like. For libertarians, they don't like to see state overreach of power. For leftists like Nathan, they don't want to see police abuse of power and prosecutorial abuse of power. But many feminists and progressives have bought into the hysteria too. So we see we have it all here. We have hysteria, we have witch trials, we have moral panic, we have McCarthyism. I mean, all of this stuff loaded down in one rhetorical mis- mishmash of garbage in this paragraph. And, you know, all of this stuff was rewarded at the time. I mean, the, the, this lady was highly thought of for writing this sort of bilge. But you're about to find out just how bad it gets for these people who defend this sort of stuff and uh, have crafted this narrative. Feminists and progressives have bought into this hysteria too. Ritual abuse panic has become an outlet for women's rage at sexual violence and harassment. While this anger could hardly be more justified, it has increasingly been articulated through anti-sexual current in the feminist movement a current that jives with the views of conservatives who loathe pornography and who also fear women, their need for daycare, their independence, and their sexuality. So see here, once again, it's it's fear, it's male fear, it's traditional fear. Oh my goodness, they just can't handle change. Then in the next paragraph, she covers what I like to refer to as the Freudian break or the Freudian snap. Okay, so Freud was originally working on ideas related to people who came in and talked about how people in their own families had sexually abused them. So he began to publish this material. A bunch of the wealthy elites at his time were very disturbed by the fact that he was publishing this, so they put a bunch of pressure on him. And then he came up with the Oedipus and Electra complexes, where he said that the boy has a repressed sexual desire for the mother, so it's totally fraudulent, totally fake. He just completely made it up. It's not based on anything in reality whatsoever, and the Electra Complex was where the daughter has a repressed sexual desire for the father. These are just complete nonsense, complete poppycock. They have no basis in reality. But this began to break down in the late 1970s and early 1980s, where people actually started to talk about child sexual abuse, and then that's when it manifested with the McMartin case, where lots of stories of this started to come out. So anyway, she continues here, Quote, feminists who analyze incest defined it as inherently victimizing the daughter. 
They said her extreme dependence on her family and the men in it meant she could not give meaningful consent to sex. But then they made a dubious leap. Now get this, dubious leap. They began applying their perspective on incest to non-relatives. So really what she's saying here is a 37-year-old can sleep with a 12-year-old and they can give meaningful consent, right? Or a 40-year-old with a 16-year-old. That's meaningful consent because it's a non-relative. Judith Herman, in her book, Father-daughter incest wrote that any relationship between an adult and a child, even if the child is a teenager, quote, must necessarily take on some of the coercive characteristics of rape. Yeah, she would be right there, Miss Nathan, and you would be wrong with what you're trying to imply. Florence Rush compared children choosing adult sex partners to chickens meeting up with hungry foxes. Yep, that about sizes it up right. Then get this, what she follows it up with. This is absolutely disgusting. Actually, studies show that the realities of transgenerational sex outside the family, i.e. child molestation, pederasty, and pedophilic rape, where individual adults wield a good deal less power over children are more ambiguous, she says. Most male pedophilia consists of caressing and fondling. Oh, that's okay. Just just let the, uh, the guy next door who's 30-something years old be rubbing all over your little boy or your little girl. Oh, that's okay. He's just caressing them and fondling them. He's like Michael Jackson a little bit. For most children, these experiences appear to be at best confusing, at worst traumatic, but others seem to willingly participate, and some adults recall that while still legally minors, they accepted even welcomed sex with grown-ups. And she writes as a parenthetical aside here, quote, Many gay men, for example, say they instigated these encounters, and some suggest that such relationships offer the boys the only real possibility for healthy acculturation into homosexuality. Nonetheless, the prevailing feminist view of child sexual abuse broadened its meaning to include, without distinctions, any contact between someone below the age of consent with someone older, even if that meant ignoring how the younger partner remembered the incident. So here it's their memory that's being checked. So if you were abused at 14 by a 40-year-old and you remember it at 28 as being not so bad, there's no concept here of saying, well, maybe this was a coping mechanism that you had to tell yourself in order to be able to get along with your life after being traumatically abused by someone so much older and horribly irresponsible, a monster. And just a couple more samples here for good measure uh, from the top of page three, quote, In the early 1980s, feminist sociologist Diana Russell asked women to remember any unwanted sexual contact before age 18, including with boyfriends of the same age. Sexual contact meaning anything from blank, which I can't say on the show, to glimpsing a flasher to an unwelcome hug. She also asked women to recall, quote, incest defined as sexual contact between relatives, even distant ones, more than five years apart in age by Russell standards, And get this, she's basically uh, excusing this or saying that this uh, really should not be all that big of a problem. Tongue kissing between a 13-year-old and her cousin's, her cousin's 19-year-old husband would be considered incestuous and therefore exploitative. I would say it's definitely exploitative, no matter how you define it. Even if the woman remembered enjoying it. Oh, the woman, she remembers enjoying kissing her cousin's husband when she was 13 and he was 19. Are you kidding me. Using her, get this, extravagantly broad definitions, she found that one in five women were incest victims. Okay, so maybe we could knock part of that out, but more than half suffered child sexual abuse. She's trying to diminish that here. She's trying to downplay that here. She's trying to act like that's absurd here. Can you believe this kind of writing was rewarded at the time and that this person is still praised and highly talked about as one of the constructors of the witch hunt narrative, this kind of person being involved in this is sickening to me, okay? My personal opinion, twisted and sickening. And now let's jump down a little bit here where she starts to talk about the horrendous child pornography and downplays that as well. Quote, as for kitty porn, oh, it's just kitty porn. Don't worry about kitty porn. It's estimated that even before 1978, when all production and commercial distribution of such material was banned under federal law, only about 5,000 to 7,000 were involved worldwide. Oh, well, 
only 5,000 to 7,000 kids are just having their lives utterly, completely destroyed and mutilated, right? Oh, just no big deal there. Don't worry. It's kitty porn. Since then, the commercial market in America, minuscule to begin with, has been virtually wiped out. And I guarantee you, if you talk to people who were involved in investigating this stuff in 1990, that was not true. And it's most certainly not true today where the stuff is all over the place and is definitely international, definitely worldwide. And America is the center point of it all. And there's all kinds of research and investigative um, angles that back this up. And uh, I'm not going to cover anything else that she has to say here because I find the whole matter just absolutely stomach-churning. But I thought it was important for the audience to know the kinds of people involved, the kinds of arguments involved. So not only do we have people who gave interviews with Pydeca earlier with the Dutch pedophile magazines, ba basically the Dutch equivalent of NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association, basically praising pedophiles, praising pedophilia, saying that it's a, you know, a natural way to exist. I'll, I'll link some of this material below so you know about that. But also publishers such as the Eberleys who published child pornography itself, and they ended up being involved in this whole crafting of the witch hunt narrative or the satanic panic mythos. And they're still quoted. If you go to Wikipedia, right now uh, very prominently cited are both uh, Debbie Nathan here from this article that I was just critiquing and also the Eberleys and it, they act like these are credible sources of information that hey you need to put these people on a pedestal listen to what they have to say about the satanic panic about the witch hunt about the hysteria about the Salem witch trials about the McCarthyism of the 1980s and how hundreds of of cases came up, and actually uh, Professor Ross Chite, who wrote the Witch Hunt Narrative book, over 500 pages long, documented there were not hundreds of these cases. That was absolutely a patently false claim that all these people continually make, and you still hear it when you hear the uh, you know, common commentary bros on YouTube and all that sort of stuff, you know, where they put together their little five-minute or eight-minute video, and they talk about the satanic panic, and Dungeons and Dragons, you know, everybody's kids are going to get possessed and Christians were crazy and none of this stuff was actually going on. Despite the actual experiences of the people involved that some of these things actually did go on, there actually were convictions and some of the convictions still stand even today as I've covered in the Country Walk or Frank Fuster case. But I think it's important to uh, just to note some of the people involved and how they constructed their arguments and how these arguments won, especially as they were promoted through the media. And on a related note here, I want you to pay attention to the source of this. Uh, a lot of the Debbie Nathan articles were published by the Village Voice. And the Village Voice is important because they were later tied into child sex trafficking investigations. It's long been in the crosshairs of controversy, a site for underage sex crimes, prostitutes, and a platform for human trafficking. Its founders say the illegal activity is something they policed but could not control. Carl Ferrer, the former CEO of Backpage.com, says he'll testify against the other founders charged with money laundering. It's significant because it's likely the end to a site that has been implicated in hundreds of local cases and some major international operations connected to Minnesota. In 2016, investigators say women were smuggled here from Thailand and allegedly advertised on Backpage in the Twin Cities. The victims in this case lived as modern day slaves. The list goes on. In Washington County, in a two year span, authorities busted 54 Johns, 23 sex traffickers and found 52 victims. In that same time, they found 174,000 back page ads just in the Twin Cities. Cases in New Ulm, Mankato, Woodbury, and around the state where dozens have been arrested. Investigators say so long there's a will, there's a way, but hope the shutdown of a site that attracted so much illegal activity makes a dent in the sex trafficking trade. So it is important here to note this Village Voice connection. The Village Voice published these articles, uh, many articles in this vein from Debbie Nathan, basically uh, debunking this whole thing as a mere hysteria and moral panic of the 80s. The Village Voice also ties into child sex trafficking investigations. There's uh, three different documentaries I would suggest that you watch. Uh, you have the one called Selling the Girl Next Door, I Am Jane Doe, and of course An Open Secret, and that gives uh, a lot more information about these kinds of things, but 
the village voice, uh, the leadership there anyway, the founders seem to have a specific interest in trying to promote this sort of stuff and, and sort of diminish the public's concern with uh, child sex trafficking and all of this. And this is related to Backpage.com, which was shut down by the federal authorities later on because lots of 12, 13, 14, 15-year-old girls were actually being sexually trafficked on there to adults, basically under the guise of prostitutes who were of age, but they actually were not of age, and the people at Backpage.com knew this. In April of 2018, you had the two founders of the Village Voice, uh, Jim or James Larkin and Michael Lacey, were arrested as part of a 93-count indictment stemming from a federal human trafficking investigation into Backpage.com. And it was uh, the Village Voice, of course, that was early and often publishing these articles, promoting the concept of a satanic panic. Here's a section from a USA Today article covering this, titled, Feds Charge Backpage Founder After Human Trafficking Investigation from April of 2018. A founder of a 45-year-old alternative weekly newspaper in Phoenix has been charged in the apparent culmination of a federal human trafficking investigation. Michael Lacey, 69, of Sedona, Arizona, who helped build a nationwide media empire out of the Phoenix New Times, was charged Friday as part of a 93-count indictment that remained sealed late Friday, according to Lacey's lawyer. Lacey also co-founded the online classified advertising site Backpage, and authorities had spent months probing whether the website served as a willing participant in the online sale of sex, including with underage girls. And of course, that is the biggest part of the problem. Speaking as a libertarian, prostitution is not so much the problem. The underage part of it, though, transfers that from underage prostitution to pedophilia and rape. And these guys were literally just rolling in hundreds of millions of dollars uh, from the transactions that took place in these advertising sections of these uh, so-called adult section. But of course, the uh, young children were involved in this also, and there's lots of evidence that's uh, coming out and a lot more that I think will come out at the trials, revealing how much they knew and how much was being covered up behind the scenes. Then I move from that to an article from Jezebel, which is basically defending the whole thing, saying that Backpage was uh, really good for prostitutes and prostitution. But of course, again, as I said, the adult world agendas always have to come first while the world of children is uh, sacrificed to those agendas. So Jezebel will say, prostitution really good, no concern at all with child prostitution, right? Child rape. But uh, part of the article says here, Backpage started as an online branch of Village Voice Media. In 2012, Village Voice Media owners Mike Lacey and Jim Larkin sold off their 13 alt-weeklies, including the Village Voice, SF Weekly, LA Weekly, Westward, and Phoenix New Times, and kept Backpage, of course, because they were rolling in dough from Backpage. And in 2014, Lacey and Larkin sold their interest in the company to CEO Carl Ferrer. This sounds like a quality fellow who was charged with pimping a minor in 2016. Just the kind of person you want to hand things over to. I have another article here on this from the Washington Post of all places. Top officials at Backpage.com indicted after classified site taken down. Uh, by Tom Jackman and Mark Berman, April 2018. Seven top officials of the website Backpage.com, long accused of facilitating child sex trafficking, which it was, have been arrested after a grand jury in Phoenix issued a 93-count indictment alleging conspiracy, facilitating prostitution, and money laundering. Skip down a bit here. The indictment accuses Backpage of facilitating prostitution committed by those posting ads on the site, specifically citing 17 victims traffic trafficked on Backpage, some as young as 14. Authorities also allege the company laundered some of the estimated $500 million in prostitution-related revenue the site had generated since its launch. So, of course, that's why they gave up Village Voice Media and kept Backpage. Quote, Many of the ads published on Backpage depicted children who were victims of sex trafficking, the indictment states, although Backpage has sought to create the perception that it diligently attempts to prevent the publication of such ads. The, real the reality is that Backpage has allowed such ads to be published while declining for financial reasons to take necessary steps to address that problem. 
Another interesting part of this article says, one 16-year-old girl in Chicago was killed in 2016 after responding to an ad placed by her pimp on Backpage. The indictment discusses another girl who was killed after being prostituted on Backpage, a case in which the assailant then attempted to burn the victim's body. Backpage even refused the victim's father's request to remove the ad showing his deceased daughter, the indictment states. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children has said that 73% of child trafficking reports it receives from the public stem from Backpage.com. But you're not going to hear that from Slate or Jezebel or even Reason because Reason has an interest as a libertarian outlet in promoting prostitution, but ignoring, again, the world of children that gets damaged so frequently. Another part of the article goes on here. The courts in each case invited Congress to amend the Decency Act, so the Senate Subcommittee on Investigations launched a probe into Backpage and found that Backpage employees were editing prostitution ads to delete references to underage girls while still allowing the ads themselves to be posted. This is concealment. So I wanted to cover all of that just to sort of give you a sense of the flavor and the dimensions of how this whole thing has spread out over time and uh, why the Village Voice, I think, would have this interest in promoting articles of the uh, witch hunt narrative, of the satanic panic mythos, of claiming that it was all just hysteria, that nobody needs to be concerned with child molestation or human sex trafficking or child prostitution, so on and so forth. And then you have the founders of that very outlet then going on to have Backpage where they engaged in that very thing and then made hundreds of millions of dollars off of it. So there's this huge profit motive involved there that usually the left decries until it's one of their pet project issues. If you've enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Thank you.